being the oncologist with the diagnosis in your hand and you can say, Jesus. There's just something about the name. That's why they don't, they don't curse Muhammad when, they, when they're in trouble. They ain't cursing Buddha or Harry Krishna or Joseph Smith, but the world's cursing Jesus because there's just something about the name. He's so powerful. Think about it. Our God is so powerful. You can just say his name and miracles happen. That's the power of the name of Jesus. Thank you, praise team. As we turn in our Bibles to Ephesians 2 and 1, there's a, such a great sense that God is going to do something here with the same expectation that we've met him, he's met us. He wants to work in our lives more than we want him to work in our lives. The only thing more powerful than God is, is what he gave you, which is your will. But if you'll say, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Amen? Miracles can happen in the house. If we'll submit our will to him, praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, the King James reads as follows, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. And I, did we get it in New Living? Yes, here's in the New Living translation. And uh, it's, it's wonderfully translated. Um, 2 and 1. Why don't we read this out loud together? Uh, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Next verse. Verse 4. Let's read it together. But stop. Stop right there. All of us used to live that way, following the passions and desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. All of us used to live that way. I know you got your suit and your tie on and we looking all Christian this morning, but all of us used to follow the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to the wrath of God just like everyone else. Now let's read that one more time. Verse 4. Stop right there. But God. Look at your neighbor and say, but God. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for all that you've done, all that you're doing, for all that you're going to do. I praise you, Father, for your grace, your mercy. I pray, Lord, now that you would anoint me, dear God, to speak, uh, that, Lord, your word would be a lamp unto my feet and a, 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 that you would guide my words, not directed by my flesh, but directed by your spirit. Uh, I pray, dear Jesus, now, Lord, that you would come and fill this room, fill this house, fill this place uh, by the power of the name of Jesus. Uh, and everybody said, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, say it like you know who he is. Say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for being here. If you're a guest, we're not as crazy as you think we are. We're crazier. We're just more nocturnal. Come back tonight. Amen. We we just behave on Sunday morning for your benefit. But it gets real wild on the Sunday night once we wake up. Paul is writing the book of Ephesians to the church of Ephesus. They were a Gentile church that was surrounded by worldliness. Much like the world we live in today, it was a worldly church, a worldly and dark world. They were uh, converting people who had uh, worshipped idols and uh, sexual immorality that was running rampant in the world were being converted into the church and had been converted over many years. It was a diverse group of people from all types of lifestyles and 
uh, all different kinds of people. They were Gentiles, not Jews. And Paul is encouraging them to join together. That's really one theme of this book is stay united and bound together in, in love for the truth. He preaches against idolatry. He has people that are making money, making idols, and so it, it hurts their business. But he says, even if it hurts your business, don't be getting involved with things that aren't right. He says, and then they were battling their flesh. They were battling idol worship, and, and it had even slipped into the church, and complacency was alive. And so Paul reminds them. He has, in order to, to bring them back into a perspective of where they are and, and get kind of shake them again that's where our text begins he says and he says it's you that he has quickened who were dead in your trespasses and sin two and one is what we just read he said you were were dead he didn't say you are dead he's talking to people that are saved that have been born again but he says I just need to remind you of who you used to be you used to be dead in your trespasses and sin. Come on, he's not talking about people that are dead. He's talking about people that were dead, reminding them of where they came from. Let me tell you, there's a danger in forgetting where we come from. So every, every once in a while on a Sunday morning, come on, instead of new revelation, we need to look back in the rearview mirror so that complacency doesn't set in and we start thinking that we are something that we're not. Uh, and pride can get us to thinking, wow, look at what I did on my own. No, no, no. I can't let idol idolatry come in because I all of a sudden forgot who I was. No, no, no. Paul, even he took an entire chapter of the book of Acts uh, and he says in 22 and 4 of Acts, he says, I, I am persecuted the followers. I, I that were in the way, hounding some of them to death arresting them he said I threw them into prison he said the high priest and the whole council of elders can testify that this is so for I received letters from them of our Jewish brothers in Damascus authorizing me to bring fellows of the way from there to Jerusalem in chains to be punished he said I, I, I don't ever want to forget and so I'm going to put it in the Bible I'm going to write it down for all to know so that nobody starts worshiping Paul and thinking that I'm some great human being he says I know who I used to be. I was the dude killing people that were doing right. I was putting people in jail that were Christians. So, so don't ever forget where I came from. Come on, that's what he's doing to the church at Corinth. He says, don't you realize in the New Living Translation that those of you who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourself. Those who indulge in sexual sins or worship idols or commit idolatry, and he goes down the list. Uh, male prostitutes practicing homosexuality, 6 and 10 of 1 Corinthians, or the thieves or greedy people, drunkards or abusers. Uh, he says, one that cheat people. Uh, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he goes on in case you get a little too high and mighty because you're thinking he's preaching to the new converts and the sinners he says no just remember such some of you were once like that such were some of you is the King James version uh, you were you were that's you oh, come on don't sit there all high and mighty he, go down the list that's you you were the cheater you were the liar you were greedy I was the drunkard I was the abuser come on I was the one worshiping idolatry uh, but thanks be to God, he came, but God came, but God came. He said, you were dead. He said, you were dead, you were, you were dead, you were a walking zombie. In times past, Ephesians 2 and 2, where in times past, you didn't walk according to, you walked the course of this world, the way of the world. I lived life like the world said I should live my life. According to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Uh, he says the, the, the way of the world. Notice he, he tells us who is directing the way of the world. The prince of the air. The devil. Come on, let's just break it down to where we live. Who's contract, who is or ordering and directing the steps? I'm going my own way. That's what they say. No, you're not going your own way. There's two ways. There's the way of the enemy and there's the way of God. And the way, my own way is directed by the enemy. And if you don't think I'm right, just read your Bible. For there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but it leads to destruction. I'm going to do it my way. No, there is no such thing as my way. There's God's way and hell's way. And one leads to righteousness and one leads to damnation. And if the words coming out of your mouth are, I'll just do it my way, well, I just think it, I, 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 I. It's humanistic at its core, satanic at its root. Let me tell you what it is. It's the way of the sinner. There is only one way, and that way is the 
way of the cross and the way of the word and you can get up today from the way come on called unrighteousness and you can walk in the way of light he said among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh he said I I used to go the way I thought was right. I followed my dreams. I did what I wanted to do. He said, and my conversation was one that was of the lust of the flesh. He said, and what I would live for was the fulfilling of the desires of my own flesh and of my mind. My mission in life, Paul, he says, this is how we all used to be. He said, if I wanted it, I got it. If I wanted to smoke it, I smoked it. If I wanted to drink it, if I, I drunk it. If I wanted to buy it, I bought it. If I wanted to sleep with it, I slept with it. I just did what I wanted to do. And we're by nature the children of wrath as everybody else. Ah, he's saying we were a mess. We were children of wrath. He's saying we were dead. We were, you, you can, you, we, when you, you were walking, you were like a zombie. going the way of sin led by the force of Satan I, I, I walked where I wanted to walk I talked of wicked things I, my mind was filled with lust and things that only I desired that, that, that was the way I went he said we were messed up we were messed up in our minds we were messed up in our deeds we were messed up in our words we were messed up in our wants we was just messed up look at your neighbor and say we was messed up you can get personal. You can say, I was messed up. No, I was a jacked up freak show. Come on now. I was a disaster. I was walking. Look at your other neighbor, the one you, you, you a little bit arrogant. You know, you didn't tell him because you didn't want him to know. So let him know. Say, we was, we was, it was me. I was a walking zombie. I, I was broken. And when I say broken, I'm not like talking broken half. There's all kinds of broken. I'm not talking about, oh, I was broken and Jesus put me back together. I was shattered into so many pieces, the pieces were lost. To put me back together, he had to, he had to make a few new pieces. I was, I'm not talking about I just had a little crack in the side. I'm talking about my life was shattered. It was, bro that's what he said. You were dead. You were a disaster. Don't you forget it. Don't let Matthew Tuttle forget what I was before the grace of God found me. He said, that's who you were. And then verse four says, but God, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love therewith he loved us even when we were dead in our sins hath quickened us together with Christ by grace are ye saved and he's raised us up. He didn't leave us broken, he raised us up. How did he raise us up? Together. He raised us up together and made us sit together. Where am I sitting? You may see me in a church pew, but in my spirit, I'm seated in heavenly places. I said, I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ. You ought to let your spirit look, let your eyes look through your spirit because your eyes could see that you're in a place where you don't deserve to be. I'm in heavenly places. I've got a perspective of my past that is different because of Christ Jesus. Woo! Mm, say it again, preacher. Okay, you were messed up in your mind. You were messed up in your words. You were messed up to the point of jacked up. You were falling apart, shattered into a million pieces. Somebody gonna help me preach this morning. I, I said I was messed up in my mind, my marriage, my money. I was messed up in my words, my thoughts. I was, I was confused. I was falling apart. I was all but dead. Somebody preach it to me. I said I was all but dead. My marriage was broken, but, 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 thank you, Jesus, that you interrupted what should have been a story of death, destruction, and you intervened, and God, God worked the miraculous. David, David said it like this in Psalms 124. He said, he said, if it had not been for the Lord and he said I know I'm a king and I'm a fighting machine he said but let's be real had it not been for the Lord who was on our side mm, verse 2 if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us 
He said, don't you think that these victories that I have came because I was so good? He said, if it had not been for the Lord, verse 3, they would have swallowed us alive in their burning anger. He said, had it not been for the Lord who was on my side, the waters would have engulfed us and torrents would have overwhelmed us. Had it not been for the Lord who was on my side, yes, the raging waters of their fury would have overwhelmed our very life. Had it not been for the Lord who was on my side, praise the Lord who did not let their teeth tear us apart. We escaped like a bird from a hunter's trap and the trap was broken and we are free. Our help is from the maybe you can sit there and look at us funny but baby when the bird gets out of the trap he doesn't hang around to stare at the trap he gets up and starts to fly that's what you're witnessing are people that are free free from the trap of death sin hell and the grave Come on, let me just hit it again for all the people that think we're too emotional. Come on, how can you not be emotional? How can you not have a tear trickle down your cheek an applause echo out of your hands? How can a shout not come on, come out of your belly when I think of the goodness of Jesus? When I think, and that means I just put it all in perspective. His goodness means I can look at my badness and I've got to shout hallelujah. Thank you God for saving saving me that's why we're shouting that's why we're running that's why we're dancing because of God Mm. turn to the person behind you and say I was a mess but God it's in your Bible 43 times 43 times but God oh preacher you don't understand that's all real cool Boy, you got us running. And God, yeah, God, he kept me from myself, but I'm dealing with a mother-in-law. Uh, I mean, that's another level. I got, I got family and uncles. And let me just take you down to old brother Jacob in your Bible. He ran away from his life going to the person he thought he could trust. That was his family. And his uncle became his father-in-law. That's the West Virginia gene just traveling right down through there. there. (laughs) And that uncle, who was his father-in-law, deceived him. Stolen, stole from him, lied from him. I'm not talking about one time. 31 and 7. This is how many times. He's, he's laying in bed talking to his wife one night. And this is the conversation. He says, your daddy deceived me. And keeps changing my wages and robbing me. And he's done it 10 times. I said, my family keeps stealing from me and tearing me apart. And I think I just need to, need to go off on them. But, but look at the next two words. But God intervened and he could not hurt me. I know you've got some family conflict going on and they're saying things. They're going to take the kids and walk away and leave you and you're not going to make it. But what you need to do is just be still and let God work in on your behalf. But God, God stepped in. I've seen him step in in family situations. You say, well, oh, I don't know, preacher. You don't understand on the job, and my family is a bit worse than that. Well, let's get down to worse than that. Let's get to Joe. Oh, Brother Joe, you know him. He's got some brothers, 11 of them. You know what I like about this story? What I always like to remind us is that we always want to be Joe in the story. There's 11 of the bad ones and one of the good ones. There's a high probability you're more like the brothers than you are the dude. And Come on, somebody. Just be careful who you throw in pits. Amen. Be careful. But old boy was thrown into a pit by his brother. Come on. He was sold into slavery by his family. He was tossed into a prison cell after all he did was good. Acts 7 and 9, Luke records it like this. He says, the patriarchs moved within me. He said there was church people. Mm. Sometimes there's going to be people do you wrong even in the church. Come on. And the church people were the patriarchs. These are the big dogs. The big dogs make mistakes. 
But thank God Joe wasn't like some, well, that's God, that, you know, that, I'm just going to quit and give up on God. You don't quit and give up on God because there's a fool, some moron did something stupid. Come on, you don't jump out of a boat into the ocean because you don't like the people on the boat. You'll die. There's sharks out there, baby. Don't, 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 come on. He said, he said, I was sold, he said he was sold into slavery, but, but guess what? But God was with him. Even when the high ups were against him, God was still with him. Come on. And, and, and this is at the end of it, Genesis 50 and 12. Joe is standing in front of his brothers. He's been vindicated. He said, but you thought it for you. you, you see, you thought evil against me. Your whole plan was to make it evil in my destruction, but God. I wish I had somebody that they tried to take you out, but God intervened in your life. The adversary, come on, it might have been a human that tried to come against you, but God. And here you are worried about if you're gonna make it. You're gonna make it. There's a God, there's a God, there's a God. Oh, David is fleeing from his life. He's got B-17 bombers and stealth fighter jets flying overhead. He's got the CIA, the FBI. He's got the Army Rangers. He's got the, 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 the Navy SEALs. I, I don't think he has the Coast Guard, but I'm not sure. But he, <laughs> They've called up the Volunteer Army. They got everybody. I mean, he's got the military forces and the king himself hunting him down. Come on. In 23 and 14 of 1 Samuel, David abode in the wilderness. He's hiding, and, 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 and he's in the mountains and in the wilderness, uh, and the Bible says that Saul sought him every day. The enemy was coming after him with all his forces. But some of you are waiting for the good part of the sermon. Baby, it ain't going to get much better. I've just come to tell you there's a God. And if you're in a mess, there's a God moment that's on its way. But God delivered him not into his hand. Come on. Well, my boss, my. But God. Lift up. But God. Oh, preacher, you don't understand. They're talking bad about me. They're saying lies over me. I just think I need to defend myself. Psalm 64. Listen to this one in Psalm 64. He says, oh God, listen not. 64, I'm skipping that for time's sake. Oh God, listen to my complaint. Protect. See, it's all right to complain as long as you're talking to God. Talk about your haters. Just talk about them to the one that can do something about them. If you to try to take it into your own hands, it's not going to end up good. He says, God, listen to my haters and protect my life from my enemy's threats. He says, hide me from the plots of the evil mob and from the gang of wrongdoers. He said, they are sharpening, not their knives. They are sh There's something sharper than a knife. Their tongue is like a sword and they aim their bitter whew, like arrows. They shoot from ambush at the innocent, attacking suddenly and fearlessly. They encourage each other to do evil and plan how to set their traps in secret. Who's ever going to know? You're, you're like that? And they plot their crimes that they say we've devised the perfect plan. The human heart are coming, cunning, he says. They sit in secret and they speak their lies. The crowd, you, you know, this is the crowd that gathers at your job. Their backs are turned and they're whispering and the plans are being made. You know what I'm talking about. Th these are the people that team up with the fellow haters. The ones that, you know, that, that they get together and tell you, oh, we're going to get a lawyer. You're never going to see your kids. You know, you're a bad parent. False charges that aren't true. Come on. Lies and lies. This, this, is, th th this, this verse applies to the modern internet crowd. You know, the ones who shoot and never ask. Post but never inquire. The, the, these people are dangerous. I, I, I said it recently. I said, that right now there's nothing more dangerous than an is ignorant carnal person with the internet. It's like an infant with a loaded weapon. You know what I mean? It's, a, it's scary and they say things and they, they do all kinds of things and they, 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 they start talking about you. But, but before you fire off at your boss and go off on your ex... I know you got the text written out and you're about to send it to her or send it to him. Uh, read on. Here you are in this mess. Uh, they're all against you. They're talking lies about you. None of it's true. Uh, but verse 7, but God himself. Your God's got a bow and an arrow. You don't
don't have to fight the battle when the Lord fights the battle. He said there's arrows that will strike them down and their own tongues will be the ruin of them and all who see them will shake their heads in scorn and say, what was you thinking? What were you doing? You don't have to fight the battle. The battle's already been won. But God... Hallelujah. Somebody shout, but God. Yeah, I know he's dead. He's in a grave. He's been there three days. Hell is celebrating. Come on. They've got him in a sepulcher. Verse 13 of 30 of Acts, but God raises him from the dead. Paul says most people wouldn't be willing to die for an upright person. He said there ain't going to be anybody that gives their life for just a good community leader. He said there might be a few that would die for a an especially good person. You know what I mean? Like, man, that's a good guy. But let's just break it down. You ain't giving your life for pretty much any. If it comes down to me or you, I, I, I'm just not going. I got life insurance. <laughs> I'm guessing it's going to be me going down. He said you wouldn't do, give your life for a good person. He said you wouldn't give your life for a real good person. But God showed his great love to us sending Christ to die while while you were whoring while you were sinning while you was being what you was being uh, he sent down but God but God but God that's why hands go up that's why you're like man it's a lot to go to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night but really if I think of everything he's done for me it, it's really it's really we should have a fifth service you know what I mean like I should be here every day I, there's no way come on if when I put it in true perspective I, I've got too many but God moments and I've come to preach to somebody in a storm somebody going through a trial somebody that's going through tribulation in your home your life your family or finance and tell you there's a God moment that can happen uh, be still and let God fight the battle for you but God but God I was talking this week to a friend of mine, Randy Weed. Uh, for all of y'all, he don't sell weed. That's his last name. He, some of y'all were like, can I get his number? Nope. Nope. That's his last name. He's a preacher. Uh, hey, ain't that great? <laughs> I was always kind of embarrassed. I was like, Tuttle's kind of weird that I met Randy Weed. I was like, all right. You got me beat. I've got a few that are worse than that. Hey, he was assistant pastor up in Indiana, and uh, he got a call from, from Sean, who was the son of a man that attended his church, and his dad was in the hospital. He was uh, brain dead, no hope. Randy said, we went in, me and the boy went in, and he had been like that for several days, went into the ICU, and he said, when we walked in, we just started praying for him, nothing fancy. He said, the man's eyes open. His brain goes completely normal. He's talking to us. He sits up, and, and he said, while we were in there praying, he said, uh, the nurses kept coming by. There's a little glass window, and they kept looking in and giving us like these dirty looks. Not real dirty, just kind of like frustrated looks. You know, they'd come to the door, look through the window, and be like just frustrated. And, and so uh, they, they walk out, and, uh, and, and as soon as they walk out, the doctor's over there comes up to them as they're getting ready to leave, and he says, hey, hold on just a second. He said, uh, uh, Pastor Weed, you know the rules here. And he said, what do you mean? He says, you're only allowed to have max three people in the waiting room, in the, in the ICU with people at a time. He said, well, it's just me and Sean. He said, no, sir. He said, didn't you see all them nurses? He said, I've had multiple reports that that entire room was completely full of people while y'all were in there all praying. He said, and, and I want you to respect our rules here at the hospital. And Randy said, sir, there, there's nobody. It's just me and him. And he, he said, go in that room. And, and, and they went in that room and the man was sitting up. The next day, the man went home. He was about dead, but God. The doctor called him up. He said, I need to know more about your preacher. He said, everyone on the ICU floor that, that was in there when you were there, two days later, they were all discharged. They all lived. He said, how does that happen? Randy said, it had to be God. I'm going to tell you, there's some things I don't have explanation to. I just have a, but God. I said, God did it. God did it. God did it. I, I, I was telling my... 
I was telling my brother-in-law Joel about the story and he, we were talking about it we both know uh, Randy he said oh man he said you don't maybe you don't remember he said but, but when I was I don't remember how many months he said but it was pretty much close to full term he said the umbilical cord was wrapped around my neck he said I was dead my mother went in they said we're going to take the baby and uh, he said mom said no I'm going to go to church they said, if you go to church, the longer you wait, the higher risk of your own survival. So he said, she went to the church, my mother-in-law, Sister McCoy. This isn't in Indiana or China. We're right here in Texas now, all right? Come on. He says, and my mother said, I felt, Sister McCoy said, I felt like the Lord said, if you'll worship me, it'll be all right. And she began to worship with a dead child in her womb. She said, as I begin to worship, come on, she said, I felt something begin to turn inside of me. Uh, come on, and you've heard Joel McCoy preach. Uh, I know the enemy's come to tell some of you that it's dead, it's over, but maybe the worship is more than just a response to a good preacher point. Maybe the running is more than just a little crazy Pentecostal radicalism. Maybe it's us saying, God, we've got nothing else but you. So, Lord, you begin to work. You begin to do the... You begin to do it, you begin to work, and we will respond. Come on, I know there's some people in the house, there's a lot of people in the house that have some but God moments. I've got a picture of Scott. Some of us know the story, but some of you are new. There's Scott Davis who had fallen off of a high ladder. 21 days he spent in ICU with 10 broken ribs, two fractures in his vertebrae, a collapsed lung, and no hope. But... Where you at, Scott? Come on, run, 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 run up here. Come on, they said he ain't probably never gonna walk and he's probably not gonna live. Come right up here, right up here. This is for somebody, come on, that needs a miracle in your body. I've come to tell you there's a God that can heal. There's a God, I've been in the hospital too many times. I've seen too many dead people get up out of, out of their deathbed and, and lame people walk up out of wheelchairs. God is able. Raylan. Is Raylan here today from the Hope House? Yeah, come on, stand right there. She said, I got the Holy Ghost when I was 11. Come on up here to Children's Church, and I believe God would answer any prayer. And then my dad died in front of me, and I blamed God. I got bitter with everyone and started smoking and drinking, turning to emotions. It grew into popping pills and staying high for 24 hours, seven days a week, months on end. I wouldn't sober. I turned 18 and moved out of my Pentecostal mother's home and ended up in relationship with drugs and abuse. I finally tried killing myself. When I thought I was about to die, uh, my Pentecostal raising kicked in. Aren't you thankful? I, I wonder if I got a mama with a backslidden child. So, uh, you got it. She said, I said, God, help me and don't let me die because I don't want to go to hell. And if you let me survive this, change my situation because I can't stop using without your help. When I woke up, I couldn't get sober, she said. He saved my life, but I couldn't get sober. Thank you. Moved me to another state, and six months later, I was filled with the Holy Ghost. God rooted out the bitterness. Come on. He put me here in Vider. I'm only one hour away from my home. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and I've got hope. What are you saying? I'm saying there's a God. There's a God and no matter how dark the night, how bitter, come on, the situation, uh, he can root out your root of bitterness. Uh, he can pull out your anger. God. Come on, it's easy to read it in the Bible, but go ahead and take me by the hand. We're gonna dance right here. But God, don't make fun of us dancing. Uh, we've had God moments. Uh, don't wonder why we shout. We've been having God moments. But God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Dim the lights. Come on. This is why we do this. This is why we run the buses. This is why we go to prisons. This is why we have church. Is to give people a but God moment. Where you at, Hannah? Come on. Methamphetamines, heroin, witchcraft, fentanyl, every possible thing after being raised in Pentecost. She ran away, man after man, overdose after overdose, dim the lights. Got a little video. This is her. This is Hannah. You got volume? We need volume. Or 
if you can't hear it, I'm going to tell you what they're saying. They're slapping her in the face saying, come back alive, come back alive, come back alive. It was caught on a blink camera. There's many, many minutes of it. I'm not going to play it all. But right there, they're pressing on her chest, mouth to mouth. 911's on the, on the phone. They're trying to bring her back to life because she had died. Let me tell you something. That's the story that's repeated over and over. But she didn't die. Well, I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's real. The devil is a liar. It's true. And no matter where you're at, no matter the hopelessness of your heart, no matter the depths of your doubt, let the testimony of somebody tell you there is a God and he wants to step into your life. He wants to change. Come on, somebody. You ought to give him a praise and give him a shout, not just for her, but for what he's doing in your life. There is a God. There is a God. There is a God. Come on, I know you're broken, but God. I know you're sick, but God. I know, I know you, the devil says you can't be healed, but God. Come on. I'm the result of a mother who wasn't supposed to have children who had faith, and but God. I was born. That 18 wheeler sliding to me on black ice with my wheels spinning, and I'd say, Jesus, and I don't know how, but God. There's stories of people whose suicide letters were written, but for some reason, when they took the pills, they didn't die. But God. There's people in this house that know that their family has put guns in their mouths and pulled the trigger, but they didn't die. But God. Each and every one of you could stand up here and we could go all day long and you could say it was like this and it was like that but God but God but God so I'm here for somebody today that's at the end and you don't know what to do you're, you're, there's a comma and a long pause you're ready to put a period and say I'm done but but God but God's going to intervene in your life. He's going to step in and give you hope. And this testimony isn't something you're going to see on a screen. It's something you're going to live out in your life. Don't you put a period to the marriage. Don't you put a period to the child. Don't you put an end to the life. There's a comma. But God. God's about to make a way. Why? I've seen him do it over and over and over and over and over and over again. And over again and over again. I wonder if I got anybody in the house. I'm going to stop right here. Hey, man, that says, you know what, preacher? I've been there. I've overdosed on drugs. Just wave your hand at me. All right, there's enough of you. Get up here quick. Flesh up across the altar. Hey, man, these people overdosed on drugs. An OD. Come on. So, you see, you thought we was just pretty little Pentecostals with our cute little suits and ties and ladies with the buns on the back of their head. Nah, we're just a bunch of crazy people that, that were set free. Set free. Look at this. Come on. You don't have to double up, all, fan out all the way across. Anybody so drunk on alcohol? Where's, where's, where's Stephen? You at Strout? Where you at, bub? Where's he at? He's in here. He's, come on, Bo. 20-something years. Couldn't get by without a drink. Am I right? Stephen, am I right? How many years? Don't even know. Don't even know. Tried everything. Two years ago on Pentecost Sunday, he couldn't get by without a drink. Am I right, Stephen? Police officer. Walked up here, him and Jerry. Y'all remember it? Maybe you don't. It's been how long has it been now? Two years. Two years. You, you had any drinks since two years? Not a drop. Not a drop. Woo. I walked out of here, I knew. I knew. I'm free. 20 something years, tried everything but. But God, I know some of you, the devil's telling y'all he's the preacher just after your money trying to get you to commit so he can have 10% of your income. No, no, no. Nobody, nobody's going to put none of these people up here. The, these right here are testimonies. I'll tell you what I'm after. I'm after your but God moment. I'm after your but God moment. I'm, don't you let the devil rob you of a life-changing, life-altering moment. There's a God-altering moment. Spread out across here and face the crowd. Heads are bowed right now. If you'd be honest with yourself, God and your pastor, no one's looking. I'm not going to let you lift your hand until I make sure every eye is closed. So please respect those in the house with eyes closed. It's me, you, and God. Uh, the pastor saying confidentiality agreement. I ain't going to tell nobody but God. But I need to know, is there somebody 
that walked into the house and says, Preacher, I'm at a but God kind of moment. I need God to move in my family, my finance. I need him to move in my body. I need him to work a miracle in my life. Just raise your hand real quick. Raise your hands are going up. Hands are going up. On the left section, come on, keep your hand up. There's at least 10 people on my far left. Be your right. There's 10 in the next section. I see five or six in the next. I see seven or eight in the next. I see close to 10 in the following and at least 10 on the next in the balcony. I see several hands that are going up. What I want you to do is keep your eyes closed and heads bowed except those whose hands are raised. I want you now to take a step of faith. I want you to come up and you're not going to have a preacher pray for you today. I don't feel to have the deacons or the elders. What I'm going to have is somebody that used to be addicted to drugs, that used to be addicted to alcohol, that knows what it's like to lay on a bed. Come on and say, God, if you don't save me, I'm going to die. And I want their faith to be laid on your head. Hands are going to be laid on you tonight, this morning. If you're not comfortable with that, then you shouldn't come. But if you're at the gotten but God moment, you ought to come right now. Come up. You're not going to come alone. I promise you, there's a hundred people that lifted their hands. At least a hundred people that'll come. They don't all, they're not all going to come. But if you're at that moment, if you're at that place... I want you to get in front of somebody. Step up right up in close to them. Come on. I don't just need a I don't just need a fancy prayer. I need a desperate prayer. I don't need somebody that prayed and learned how to do it at, at theological seminary with a doctor's degree. I need somebody that knows how to pray from a place of death. I need somebody that knows how to pray a deathbed kind of prayer over my life. Gather in, gather in, gather in. Now, those of you that have experienced the favor and you've got faith, I wonder if we could send with in these needs. Come on with those that have been at, at, at hell's door and those that come on are standing at heaven's gate. If you could come right now and come in behind these. Come in and lay your hand on their back. Now now listen to me ex-druggies and all you people now. You don't. I don't need a fancy prayer. Don't use King James Version. You pray for them like you prayed. Come on. When you thought you was going to die. When you were so far out of your mouth. Out of your mind and they were giving you mouth to mouth. Pray like that. Pray like you prayed. Come on when there was no hope and the only thing you had was the answer from heaven the only hope I have that's how you lift your voice in the name of Jesus Father we lift our voices and we're not coming to you pretty we're not coming to you with theology we're coming to you desperate with needs we don't understand everything and we don't know why but we know that you can interrupt our story you can change the outcome you dear Jesus can in the name of Jesus I pray, Lord, for miracles in homes. Miracle, Lord, in body. I pray, dear God, in the name of Jesus, that healing virtue would begin to flow. Sickness in the name of Jesus would dry up. Cancers and tumors. That's it, young man. That's it. That's it. Go ahead. If you don't know the words to say, you say the name of Jesus. His name is all-encompassing of all his attributes. When you say Jesus, come on, you're saying deliverer. When you say Jesus, you're saying lamb and lion of the tribe of Judah. When you say Jesus, you're saying lily of the valley. When you say Jesus, come on, you're saying alpha, which is beginning, and you're saying omega, which is the ending. When you say Jesus, it's the door of escape in the valley of Achor. When you say Jesus, Jesus, come on, it's the name that demons tremble at. When you say Jesus, it's the way. When you say Jesus, it's the truth to the lies. Say it, Jesus, 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 Jesus. There's just something about it. Oh, hallelujah. For we, when we don't know how to pray, he said the Spirit will begin to pray through you with groanings that are not uttered. Why you speak in tongues? Because sometimes I don't know what to say. Sometimes there's some angels that need to be named, and I only know the names of three of them. So I'm going to go ahead and name them. I'm going to let my tongue begin to operate in a language that I'm not familiar with uh, so that heaven can begin to work. Uh, come on, the only tongue heaven has is yours. Uh, the only hands heaven has is ours. Uh, come on, the only feet it has is ours. That's it. Push it a little harder. A little louder. A little more. Oh, if you can't get to them, every hand ought to be laid. If you believe that the laying on of hands is for the deliverance of people, then what you do with your hands is the true testimony of how much you believe in the Bible. What you do with your hands in an altar call is the true test of your faith. If you believe you lay your hands on the sick and they recover, a hand ought to be laid. Come on, a hand ought to be laid. A voice ought to be praying. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.